<coughs> presiding officer, uh, <coughs> my lord, judges, members of the assembly, ladies and gentlemen, everyone who's interested in uh, justice in Wales, it is very good of you to come on such a wonderful evening. Uh, coming back to Wales slightly more frequently, I now realize how rare these can be at certain times of the year. <laughs> but I, I, and I certainly won't go into or get anywhere near the dangerous waters of which is the more attractive, Cardiff or Cardigan Bay. Uh, having a connection with both, I, it is a place to which I should not go. But the warmth of your introduction, it's over generosity. Thank you very, very much indeed. It is, I think, for me, uh, a great pleasure to be able to come and make uh, uh, this speech uh, this evening. And uh, I'm particularly delighted to have been asked to do it, not in a, in a university, not in a law court, but actually in a building that is so closely associated with the government here in Wales. And uh, I think what I wanted to do uh, was to say a little bit about the past and where we've got to. And I thought I would never get away with giving a talk at this time without saying something of what I thought the problems were facing Wales, as I'll explain in a little more detail, and what sort of help and what scope the Commission have. I, for me to give a lecture without saying anything about it would show that really uh, this was not courteous to do, because what is essential in the modern world is that one has an independent body of people who have a transparent and open process, but which, on the other hand, must respect uh, the way in which constitutionally uh, the process of establishing the Commission is going about. It's been for me, I think, particularly uh, one of the great pleasures I had when I was the presiding judge in Wales, was to help what I would call real legal historians, uh, such as Professor Thomas Watkin and Richard Ireland and others, in building on the work of the great le Welsh legal scholars, particularly Professor David Jenkins, in establishing the Welsh Legal History Society. I felt that Wales really lacked something without a legal history society. We were the only nation within the British Isles that didn't have a legal history society, and that certainly was uh, not because Wales had uh, not made its own distinctive legal system many years ago and had made a remarkable contribution to the development of the law in general and the common law in particular. So I think that we, are, we can now see Wales and where we've got to in a much broader uh, historic context. And when I turn to look at the, and try and understand a bit better, uh, the, the origins of where we have come to today, we really find a remarkable history. When uh, the Parliamentary Select Committee in 1817 to 1821 inquired into the courts of great session in Wales, it was an opportunity that was taken to see how well justice in Wales had worked in the ensuing period from their establishment in the Act of Union of 1535. But when those courts uh, were abolished, it really is remarkable that actually Wales's legal identity survived intact. I think, as uh, the presiding officers mentioned, it's partly due uh, to the fact that the Welsh language was strong then and is strong again now. But I think it was also due uh, to the tenacity of many uh, Welsh lawyers and judges in fighting to keep the legal identity of Wales. Partly you see it in the controversies surrounding the appointment of uh, Welsh-speaking judges uh, to becoming judges of the county court, uh, and partly uh, you see it in the imaginative steps that were taken to try and build better legal institutions in Wales. And we then relied very much on great people, lawyer politicians such as Sir David Rinmore Jones, W. Llewellyn Williams, judges who sat in Wales, particularly one well known at least by statute, uh, to Judge uh, Gwilym Williams outside the Cardiff Law Courts, Judge Ivor Bowen to those who are students of the recently reprinted statutes of Wales and Judge Artemis Jones, whose name is engraved on the heart of every young taught lawyer. 
and the well-known London judges, uh, Bank, Sankey, and Aitken. I think it was their tenacity that kept it going. And when you ask yourself why did a distinctive legal system uh, survive in Wales, because although it was absorbed into England, I think it did not matter uh, over the period after 1830 that there were no indigenous institutions, despite the legal institutions, despite the attempts to survive them, uh, to revive them. It, it survived because of the spirit of the Welsh people. And if you contrast uh, ourselves with the position in Brittany, and this was one of the things I think the Legal History Society was able to do because the, the, the timings are so interesting, that actually the institutions did not save, if save is the right word, uh, the absorption of Brittany into France, although the timing of the, uh, of the unity of the two, uh, of Brittany and France, contrasts strongly with the unity of Wales and England. So we, I think, have been very, very fortunate. And then into the, 20, into the 20th century, it was very surprising that, again, a fight by strong individuals was needed. Because although Sir David uh, Hughes Parry uh, had established, uh, had fought to establish the Welsh Language Act and its enactment uh, in uh, 1967, there really was a, a, a major threat to the identity of the Welsh legal system and Wales as, as a distinctive part in the Beeching Commission. We all know Dr. Beeching for what he did for Welsh railways, but, but, uh, and that is a, um, appears to have been a fairly permanent effect on Wales. But fortunately, his, the attempt of his commissioners to try and really abolish the separate identity of Wales, the Wales and Chester Circuit, and merge it again failed because of the tenacity of lawyers such as Elwyn Jones, Edmund Davis, Mars Jones, Eminent Hooson, Tasca Watkins, and Dewey Watkin Powell. I think if he'd have known who he was coming up against, he would have never had those thoughts in the first place, each being a formidable warrior in his own right. But we have the, in, the distinct uh, identity of Wales did survive the abolition of its court system. And I think that now we're some years into devolution, uh, there can really be no question that Wales has a distinctive identity, not only in the broader aspects of devolution, uh, but uh, as regards the law. And even uh, one can see this very shortly after uh, the uh, enactment of the Government of Wales Act was when Lord Bingham came to open the mercantile court here as Lord Justice of Wales and England, because he added the and Wales bit, they put it in the other order when he was in England. Uh, uh, <coughs> he spoke of Wales as a proud, distinctive and successful nation. Whereas uh, um, uh, about 20 years before, when there was a debate on the ill-fated Government of Wales bill, Lord Morris could only say of Wales that people felt it as a nation. And I think that devolution, therefore, has had the, the profound uh, effect of embodying, uh, I think beyond any risk, the distinct nature of, of what, how the legal system and, world, and Wales operates as a distinct entity. And that really, I think our history, it's a very short potted summary, shows that to date we have very much relied on uh, very strong people taking a position that there was something different about Wales. There was something that was distinctive about its legal traditions. And, and the spirit kept it going. But I think the time, uh, in my view, had rightly come to, to see where we are today as regards the legal system. Uh, when you look at the Richard Commission reports, the James Parry Commission report, the Silk Commission report, all of them looked at justice as part of the system. And I think uh, Sir Paul Silk's commission made a number of very carefully reasoned recommendations in respect of justice, particularly youth justice, courts, probation, and prisons. But there hasn't really been an inquiry into justice in Wales, think, I think, since uh, 18, the inquiry in 1817 to 21, which I mentioned, the select committee, which led to the abolition of the courts of great sessions. 
Beeching, the St. Obin Commission, and the various commissions that sat during the, 19, during the, 20, the late 19th and early 20th centuries really only looked at Wales as an aspect of England. And I think as the First Minister, if I may say so, was, was absolutely right that on the 20th anniversary of the vote for devolution, there really was a need to look again at justice in Wales. And it seems to me appropriate tonight for me to say something of what, I, what are my own personal views are of the task that faced the Commission. I want to make it abundantly clear that what I say are my own views. Secondly, that my task is really to try and explain the issues. Because what I'm anxious to do is actually to try and make people Give out, give out, to give thought as an earlier stage as possible about what the problems are or aren't. And I can only give, I think, today my own personal views. Uh, it would be wholly wrong of me to say anything about potential solutions. Uh, the solutions, if the Commission recommends any, will be arrived at by a group of individuals, strong and independent, and I will stress both of those words, who uh, I, uh, I very much anticipate will have expert knowledge of the various aspects that make up uh, the justice system in Wales. But I think it's worth kicking off and trying to make certain that one gets the greatest and most transparent participation of the public uh, by seeing if I at least can begin the task by outlining what I see as the problems. Now, first of all, and I think the, the, the first question to ask is, is it right to have a commission at all? I mean, is there a need for one? Now, I think that uh, the, um, and I could have taken no possibly different view when I accepted the job, that the First Minister was right to establish it. The, the, the various commissions to which I have referred earlier have made recommendations, uh, but actually they have got nowhere. And in fact, the issues have not been grappled with. <laughs> what we need to do is accept that there has been, I, I, what I think is now universally accepted, as there has been a profound constitutional change in Wales, uh, devolution is here to stay, and therefore, where does justice fit into it? So I think, <coughs> in the abstract, that is reason enough. But I would suggest there are a number of other reasons, and I think it's worthwhile to try and explain why I think there's a much broader uh, series of issues that needs to be thought about. Uh, in uh, the period when I was a judge, and particularly in the period since the Welsh uh, Assembly uh, obtained primary legislative powers, it <coughs> became clear that the, that the Westminster government finds it difficult to deal with a nation where most powers are devolved, but powers in relation to justice is not. Uh, when you go to Scotland and Northern Ireland, justice is a devolved subject, and therefore the issues arising out of the implementation of uh, legislation made in Northern Ireland and Scotland simply don't arise as a matter for the Westminster government to consider. And for example, we found over the last few years <coughs> that there have been difficulties in carrying out what is a justice function that is central to a government. That is, when you pass a bill, you need to alter procedure, you need to create forms, you need to make certain the judges understand and know of the new law. And secondly, I think that where you now have a different structure in relation to some of the other agencies of government, you need to be able to fashion the implementation and the performance of legislation in relation uh, to uh, the different structure of the agencies. And this is particularly important in family justice and in criminal justice. And although immense efforts have been undertaken through the government here in Cardiff, the Ministry of Justice in London, the Judicial Office and Judges, it is a problem that is not easily resolved, particularly uh, at a time when there are myriad problems that, f that, that face the Westminster uh, uh, system, and particularly the Ministry of Justice. Uh, so there's a very practical problem. Third, I think, 
is the fact that justice is actually central to our society, uh, to its prosperity, to the maintenance uh, of democratic, uh, of democracy and democratic accountability, and for its harmony and good order. And when I, I try to explain this in much more detail, when I gave the uh, Lord Williams of Mostyn Memorial Lecture uh, in Gray's Inn uh, a couple of years ago, and I don't want to repeat anything I said there, but in the ensuing two or three years, I've tried everywhere I've gone to try and make government understand, if I may with respect say so, politicians understand, civil servants understand and the populace at large understand how central justice is to our society. And it seems to me that leaving out one of the functions, the central core functions of government from a system of devolution is one that needs examination. It may be right, but actually is it right? And we've never really had the opportunity, I think, of considering how, how can you operate justice that is so, so fundamental to a society uh, without it being part of a devolved area of government. And I think it's particularly important at the present time to look at this because of the huge pressures uh, that exist on the Westminster Parliament. Another reason, I think, to look at it, and I want to return to this in a little, a, a little later, is the position of the courts and the legal profession as an important contributor to the economy in their own right. I, it is now, I think, accepted that, the, and as I've said on previous occasions, the law is an industry in its own right. It is an important economic contributor. It's recognized as such. <clears throat> but the legal profession faces major challenges. The, and I would, can I just highlight two? First, there is no doubt that the digital revolution, the advent of artificial intelligence, is having and will have an increasingly profound effect on both the profession and the courts. And this is happening in a global context. We, we, it is simply impractical to develop uh, without at least a common understanding of legal systems and common principles the markets that depend on digital technology and artificial intelligence. Steps are already underway for the purpose of trying to explore these common principles between the major economic blocs, the United States, <coughs> uh, Europe, and the Far East. And it seems to me that it's essential that the implications of this are understood in Wales and that Wales is able to play a real role in it. Brexit is another factor. It is, I think, and I've said so on many occasions, a huge opportunity for the legal profession. But it is also carries with it real risks. And I think the implications of Brexit for lawyers in Wales, like many lawyers outside London, need to be understood. Therefore, a fourth reason I would suggest for looking at this is that the pressures on the legal profession are such at the moment uh, that it is of central importance that these are understood because the legal profession in Wales needs to be strengthened and we need to ensure that lawyers are able to achieve eminence and success without going to London and remaining in Cardiff. Uh, this, is a pros this has been a problem for a very long time. It's one that's always adverted to when you go back uh, to the uh, proposals for devolution in the 19, uh, in, in, in immediately after the First World War in 1919 to 1920. The worry has always been, what do you do about the attraction of London? And the fifth reason, I think, for looking at ju uh, justice in Wales is that it is, it is much easier to get things done in a small country. Certainly my own personal experience in this time when the Mercantile Court was established and we tried to improve aspects of the criminal justice system in Wales, it was easy to sit most of the people who made decisions around a table, whereas that is absolutely impossible in London. You can never have a small meeting. It's always huge. And therefore, it's much more difficult to get things done. A sixth reason, I think, is that there has never been, we've never been able to stand back and analyze what 
role can justice effectively play and what is the best way of doing it. And I will, although I will just say a little bit about um, separate jurisdictions, I think it is absolutely imperative to bear in mind that the issues are quite complicated. There is a distinct difference between, for example, a distinct <coughs> executive government function for justice in Wales and a separate court system or a separate jurisdiction for reasons that I shall explain. They're not the same. This is a much more complicated picture. And I said my seventh and final reason would be uh, that you know, you can say, well, look, haven't we talked about this for 20 years? I suspect one would take out 20 years and put 200 years. Um, but whatever period you talk about, actually, life moves on. Things have changed. And you could not possibly think of options for changing the system here without a proper degree of analysis. So although the first, uh, first minister, as any careful politician do, would give one uh, reason for it, I think on analysis there are several reasons why, whatever the outcome, it's good to look at it. Now let me then turn from that general introduction as to why it's sensible to look at, I think, four areas I wanted to concentrate on. Uh, because these are ones that have been mentioned publicly. I don't want to go into any in any detail. I just want to raise what I see as, as the issues. And the first issue is, is the, uh, that I want to say something about is the criminal justice system. Now, <coughs> as, as the presiding officer said in, in, her, in her introduction, uh, huge reforms are taking place in, in relation to uh, the uh, criminal courts, both the magistrates' courts and uh, the Crown Court. The, rep the reforms are going well, and on the whole, given the resources provided, it is proceeding apace. But the problems facing the criminal justice system are not in the courts. They are in two areas, uh, particularly the prison population uh, and rehabilitation and the ability to reduce reoffending. Now, uh, th there is little doubt at the moment that the prison population has grown uh, to an extent uh, that the resources that are required to fund it properly are, are simply not being provided. In the 1990s, uh, the prison population was half of what it is today. Sentences are undoubtedly longer. And I think it's very difficult for any government, and certainly it's proved very difficult for any government in Westminster, to take any legislative action that reduces the length of prison terms. And there are terrible difficulties, and one has to accept this, because uh, it's not for me, as a, as a recently retired judge, to question the political issues on this topic, that, for example, if you take the sentence of imprisonment for public protection, IPP, it was abolished five years ago. And despite the hard work done by the parole board, there still is a significant hard core of about th just over 3,000 people who are still in prison who had received the sentence that was abolished five years ago. Now, <coughs> uh, in uh, cases that I have done, it is clear that there's nothing the courts can do. It is only legislation that, that can uh, deal with the problem. But there's very little... Uh, prospect of any legislation being passed. And in addition to this, and I think this is now a fact that's well, well recognized, is the prison population is rising not because of short sentences, but because of the number of those who are getting increasingly longer sentences, that is, of four years or more. And so the pressure on the prison system, which everyone acknowledges, it is very high, and the prospect of rehabilitation have waned. Now, <clears throat> in, similarly, there are serious issues uh, in relation to non-custodial uh, punishment, uh, that is community service, and in the management of prisoners when they're released. Uh, both require intense resources. And it, it is in my view, absolutely clear that the probation service has had a very difficult period uh, since about 2000. It has undergone several reorganizations, and these culminated in the provision of, con of the contractualization of a large part of the service. Now, I don't think when you contractualize services, 
particularly on a long-term basis, people appreciate how difficult it is. Having been a contract lawyer all my life and having seen people enter into long-term contracts, uh, it is extremely difficult to, um, even in areas which have had long-term contracts for a long time, to get the decisions right. And so there is a really significant problem with both of these services. And so really, is there something that, is this an area where the, there is a problem that should be examined? And is it right that one should look at it in Wales? <coughs> As I've said earlier, and I see no um, harm in repeating it, that the demography of Wales is very different to that of England. Uh, the, one of the obvious examples is that when you're designing a system for England, you have to design it to cope with the vast cities, such as Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham, and of course London. They, the concentration of resources and the design of a system has to look at that. Is it necessarily right that when you look at Wales, you should have the same system as the one designed for England to cope with the, uh, with the same problems? And secondly, the reorganization of services in Wales, particularly the devolution of health uh, and the way in which mental health is dealt with, is different in Wales. Now, it is, uh, and one of the difficulties I've had in, on occasions has been to ensure people understand that mental health, which people now appreciate, plays a much more significant role in reoffending and rehabilitation than was appreciated. Uh, some years ago, it's different in Wales. And similarly, educational facilities are different. And therefore, is there a better way of trying to organize things so the system operates better? I think that is, uh, those are difficult issues. Now, what, why, why should you look at Wales? Well, it is slightly different. And I think it's also important to bear in mind that some small countries have had great success and in particular, one country in Europe which has had great success in trying to grapple with these problems is Finland. Uh, and if a small country can see a way of doing things better and differently, and I just say it's an if, it's something that should be looked at. So there is a huge problem facing the criminal justice system of England and Wales in relation to both prisons and uh, probation, and therefore it's worth looking at could we do things better. The second area I wanted to say something about was access to justice. Now, there are two particular issues on access to justice. One relates to physical access to courts. And we, uh, a huge amount is being done uh, in relation to the courts. Um, the government has, in, the current government has in, invested uh, some billion pounds in the modernization and it's proceeding apace, and I very much hope that in the very near future we'll have the legislation that's necessary to tidy it all up. But of course, one must recall that in a unitary system, although the needs of Wales have been taken fully into account, and to an extent I've tried to insist that that has happened within our unitary system, it is obviously right that the system cannot focus on the needs of Wales. It focuses on the needs and the way in which England is, or is differently organised. Now, although, um, for example, there, there are many similarities between the issues of access to justice in Wales as there are in Cumbria or in Cornwall or in Lincolnshire, um, the, the problems are not identical. Uh, one obvious illustration is, is the position of North Wales uh, because of the issues arising out of the dissolution of the long association with Chester and the time taken to travel between the North and the South. Secondly, it is, people find it very difficult to recognise that Cardiff is a capital city in its own right and ought to have facilities uh, that match it. For example, um, the Court of Appeal uh, and the uh, uh, Court of Appeal Criminal Division come here more, much more regularly and facilities can be found. 
Uh, but uh, I very much hope that just as the Supreme Court made a very, very, very successful visit to Edinburgh in the course of the summer, uh, 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 which uh, everyone seems to feel has had a very, very beneficial effect, uh, they, they, their, their plan is to come to Cardiff as well as to Belfast. Have we, have we planned our system so that we have the facilities and the infrastructure necessary to support that? It's a question that needs to be asked. So again, there are questions that seem to me that really need to be addressed and looked at as regards to access to justice. But a more controversial and difficult issue is the provision of legal aid, which is an issue of particular importance in areas which are less economically prosperous than others, or putting it the other way around, are more deprived. Now, over the years, uh, a number of people have raised with me whether it's practical to design a system for England where the concentration has to be the provision of legal aid in, in what are essentially large conurbations or heavily populated areas. Can you design a system that fits that, but also a system which deals with Wales, uh, particularly the, more, the, less, uh, the more economically deprived areas or the more rural areas? Again, it's a question that needs to be looked at. Is the system that, that is designed on a unitary basis one that best serves the needs of Wales? And I think that e there is a sort of side aspect to that question, and that really relates to the strength and growth of a strong indigenously based legal profession. Now, Therefore, those two areas are areas where there are questions. The answers, I don't know what they are, I, 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 but they are issues that need to be examined. Now, can I turn to the third question I wanted to look at, which is uh, the, the issue of jurisdiction and the court system. Now, this is the area that, uh, in, the, the little, in, the, in the publicity relating to the issues, that has received the greatest attention. Now, what this is the most complicated area in my view, partly because uh, there are three things with which, you, which you need to distinguish. One is the justice function. Uh, on several occasions when I was a, a judge, uh, I have said that Wales need a distinct justice function, and I've already referred to the reasons why it's essential. I have never expressed a view on whether that should be in Westminster or here in Cardiff, because it seemed to me inappropriate for a serving judge to comment on where it should be located. But it is critical that it has a, 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 a distinct, that there is a distinctive justice function for Wales within government. It simply is impractical if you don't have people who understand the way the legislature works and can provide the necessary changes to the machinery of the courts uh, <coughs> that will ensure the legislation is given effect to. That is one area. The second area is the court system. You can have, in any country, uh, a unitary system uh, which covers two distinct uh, areas. Uh, that's what we have at the moment, a, a unitary system at all levels. You could modify it. That would be, uh, again, something that, that could be considered. You can have an entirely separate system, or you could have a system akin to Scotland and Northern Ireland. But that's a different issue, though the answers may be one would, but that's a different issue, a court system, to the issue of, of, of a, a government justice function. And third, there's the issue of jurisdiction. Now, jurisdiction is often referred to as, or people often refer to a separate court system, or a court system as a jurisdiction. But in fact, it, it has... <coughs> essentially uh, 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 some other meanings. It's the power that a legislature has over a territory, or the power that a court uh, has over a territory, or the power a court has over a person or thing. And if I may resort to Latin once in this speech, it's jurisdiction in personam or jurisdiction in rem, and the power that a legislature has over a person or a thing. And the, an examination of the history of Wales, which I haven't got time to do tonight, would show that you can have any combination of 
these three different meanings relating to court systems and jurisdiction. I'm going to attempt to do that in a, in a speech I'll give later, uh, early next year. But actually, the analysis of this subject is extremely complex because there are different solutions. And I think that it is very, very important uh, when looking at this area to bear in mind that there are a number of factors. For example, the one which I regard as important, the centrality of justice. Another factor that's important and has been touched on, uh, the, uh, the d distinction in governance and responsibility between courts and tribunals. And I gave a, a, a more UK-wide, or oh, England and Wales and UK-wide speech uh, last year uh, to the Wales Commercial Law Association where I took up an idea the government's accepted it, which we should move to the abolition of a distinction uh, between courts and tribunals in their governance. So we had one, uh, clear, uh, one clearly integrated governance system. But that has implications for Wales as well because of its separate uh, tribunal system. Cost, and of course, as a result of the decision of the Supreme Court in relation to tribunal fees, the vexed question of what, who finances the justice system and how is it to be paid for? Do the litigants pay? or is it something that the uh, <coughs> state should pay for, or where do you draw the line? So this is an area of some difficulty. It is one that certainly ought to be looked at, and again, I think the issues are ones that need very careful analysis. And then I finally turn to what I would call the, the, the other main area, which is the professions and legal education. I think I've made it pretty clear uh, earlier on uh, that it is there are profound cha uh, challenges, shall I say, problems facing the legal profession. You cannot escape that, whether you're in London, uh, whether uh, you're I I in Paris, whether you're in New York. Things are changing as a result of technological advance. A and in the UK, it is to an extent complicated, or possibly complicated, by the opportunities or problems that arise out of Brexit, whichever political way you see it. But there is, I think, in Wales, I regret to say, despite every effort that has been made, particularly by the Law Society and others, a, a, a lack of an understanding of the profound change that is inevitable. I come, we all come from a very conservative profession, of course, with a small c, uh, and we all appreciate that, that you know, we, life is relatively comfortable. If, if things are looking bad, well, things often look bad in litigation, but they come right in the end. So don't worry. This is unfortunately something lawyers are very prone to. And I think, therefore, it is very, very important to look at is the legal profession in Wales in a position where it can withstand and adapt and build on change uh, we, it is essential to make Wales an attractive place for people to remain and practice in for the whole of their lives and not see uh, their opportunities for advancement always lying elsewhere. Uh, and it's essential for the economic development of Wales. But fundamental to the position of, the law, of any lawyer is education. Not only education when you go to law school at the age of 18, uh, or later, or, uh, but legal education as it continues through. Now, education, of course, is a devolved matter, and legal education is, in theory, no different because it falls within the current powers of the Assembly. But the freedom of any university, whether it be in Wales or in England, uh, to innovate and change legal education is, of course, constrained uh, by the requirements of the regulators of the profession. A and undoubtedly, this is the right time to look at it. Whenever you talk to academics, whether they be here in Wales or, else, or in, in London or elsewhere in England, there is a great unease about the way in which we are educating lawyers. Uh, are, are we actually, have we put enough into the curriculum that is of relevance to modern life? A question I would ask, uh, that's a question I think the Commission ought to go. But this is an extremely propitious time to be looking at it because the regulators are looking at what should be done by way of education. And I think in Wales, there is a great advantage. 
First, uh, uh, there are a small number of law schools who I'm sure can be made to work together to this end. Uh, secondly, uh, the Learned Society of Wales has seen this is something that is important to it. A and as Lord Lloyd-Jones suggested uh, in the Legal Wales Conference, uh, we re really do need an institute for Welsh law. So there's everything there that, that would enable us to examine whether a real difference can be made. So that is just a snapshot of which I have provided no answers uh, to the question, but to try and explain why I think this is a subject worth looking at, why there are profound problems, and why maybe there's a better thing to do Well, Maybe the view is at the end of the day, no, these are all very difficult, and, but the existing solutions are right. I don't know. But we will get nowhere in our examination without you telling us, and my colleagues in due course, have we got the issues right, let alone the answers? Uh, if we've got tentative solutions, I very much hope you will criticize them. I'm a very firm believer in the emperor's new clothes uh, because it's much better to be told that you've got nothing on and you're <laughs> when you are in the privacy of your uh, own deliberations than to get a torrent of criticism thereafter. I've no doubt uh, that this will be an interesting task. We will uh, come with a solution that's guided absolutely by what is in the best interests of Wales, what will support the rule of law, and what will make justice central to society. As Lord Bingham said, as I said earlier on, Wales is a proud, distinctive, and successful nation. And I think the real challenge of looking at these myriad problems in the current context is how do we ensure that Wales will, for the future, as it has done in the past, remain and live up to that tradition. Thank you.